The very best songs are the ones that strike you somewhere deep, but no matter how moving or heartbreaking their lyrics are, the real-life experiences that inspired these earworms are even more emotionally devastating than the mega-hits themselves. The world will forever know the name of Eric Clapton's son, Connor, thanks to his father's 1991 hit song, Tears in Heaven. Clapton co-wrote the number with Will Jennings for the soundtrack to 1991's Rush, shortly after Connor's accidental death earlier that year. Connor, who was just four years old at the time, fell out of the window of a 53rd floor apartment in New York City while visiting a friend of his mother, Lori Del Santo. I still don't fully accept that I'm not going to see him in a couple of weeks, if you know what I mean. It's like been a long period of time. Mm. For Laurie, it was unbelievably devastating. His tragic passing gutted the guitar icon, who was already mourning the loss of his manager, musician Stevie Ray Vaughan, and two friends of his tour group in a helicopter accident months before. Clapton immediately turned to music as a means of coping with his bitter reality, and said that the song started coming into his mind shortly before he was hired to write something for the movie. He explained, It's a little ambiguous because it could be taken to be about Connor, but it's also meant to be part of the film. Decades later, hardly anyone remembers the track for its cinematic origins, but no one can forget the anguish that inspired its creation. The Beatles' closing song for Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was co-written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney, with very different sources of inspiration in mind. While McCartney was merely reminiscing about his youth for his portion, Lennon's lyrics were reportedly influenced by the 1966 death of a 21-year-old friend named Tara Brown, an heir to the Guinness family fortune who died in a car accident. After his passing, his children were subjected to a widely publicized custody dispute between their mother and Tara's own mother. The lines, he blew his mind out in a car, he didn't notice that the lights had changed, are said to be a reference to Brown's death. Although in real life, Brown was sober when he crashed and died while driving a Lotus Elan. U2 might now be known for their participation in pop culture politicization, but before their 1983 album War, Bono's band was still working its way into international acclaim. The popularity of Sunday Bloody Sunday helped to jettison them into their permanent place in the zeitgeist, and remains one of their best-known ballads, even if it's a little heavy-handed in its delivery. If the song's lyrics sound really literal, that's because, well, they are. The title of the track was a direct call to the 1972 massacre of the same name, in which soldiers gunned down unarmed participants at a civil rights protest rally in Northern Ireland, with 14 people dying from their wounds. But U2 insists that the song has a bigger purpose than simply calling awareness to that one specific tragedy. Drummer Larry Mullen Jr. once explained that while it does call to memory the violence of that day, it's also a statement of the larger scale problem of violence around the world. And Bono has echoed this statement, adding that it's meant to remind people about the dangers of division. Division is never physical like a border. Real borders are in people's hearts, the way we see each other. On their first album, Ten, Pearl Jam delved into some difficult subject matter, including grief, sexual abuse, and homelessness. The band's third single, Jeremy, artfully grappled with the issue of depression and teen suicide. And Eddie Vedder drew the soul of the song from a very real incident he'd read about in the newspaper in 1991, the year of the album's release. On January 8, 1991, her son walked into his English classroom at Richardson High School and shot himself in front of his peers. The titular Jeremy, full name Jeremy Wade Dell, was a 16-year-old Dallas, Texas student who, after being sent to the school office to get a late slip, and reportedly told the teacher, Miss, I got what I really went for, before turning the gun upon himself. Vetter later said of the melody, I'm sorry that there was a reason to make this video or to write this song. If parents were more in tune nowadays, I know the 80s and 70s were the me generation, kids were left out, and the fact that they're left in a very tumultuous world without any guidance is very sad. When it comes to the Jim Carroll Band's best-known hit from their 1980 debut album Catholic Boy, the title says it all. While plenty of other heartbreaking songs take inspiration from individual tragic tales or personal experiences, People Who Died is about a multitude of different people in the late poet-turned-singer's life who passed away from various causes, including accidental death, suicide, murder, terminal disease, and drug overdose. Jim Carroll once explained that the song's origin is an elegy, but it's not sentimental. He added, A lot of the kids I graduated with from Catholic grammar school went to Vietnam. Forty kids graduated with me and 11 of them died there. It's an incredible percentage. Also, a lot of my friends from when I was young died or went to jail or got into drugs and died. The song just lists the people who died 
how they died, how old they were, and that's all. Well, Carol wasn't lying. Not sentimental is right. 